I want to go in a little bit of a different um, avenue today. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of pick up where I left off before, but not today. Um, I was just thinking about this this week, and uh, the Lord kind of uh, led me to uh, talk to you about something happening in the life of Paul. Paul is an amazing person who ended up writing half of the New Testament, who grew up in a very rich family uh, in Tarsus and was very educated, went to uh, Jerusalem as a young child and uh, went to what we would know today as synagogue school or private school there in the temple and was uh, very loyal, became a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he actually was called a zealot and that he really took everything that was of Scripture, and he tried to live it totally and completely in every facet of his life. And when this new sect called Little Christ, or Christians, this people, the followers of, of Jesus, when they came up, he, it just became the natural, normal thing for him to do, to uh, want to uh, stop that. Anything that was opposite of what they thought and what they believed and what they were following, they just, it became, he became the enemy of that. So he became the one who was trying to persecute uh, the new Christians that were out there at, to the point that he had letters written and approved of where he could go to other cities other than Jerusalem to find people who did not know Christ or who knew Christ and to, uh, to take them and basically throw them in jail simply because of their faith in Christ. But on his trip to one of those cities named Damascus, he met the Lord there, and it gloriously changed him. His life was never the same. Now, it was not easy for Paul. Uh, he came from a very much, like I said, a very influential family, but he had to leave all that behind because they turned their back on Paul. Everything that he had worked to achieve uh, he had to leave it behind. He could no longer be a part of that because now he was preaching Jesus, living Jesus, and he became the enemy. It was difficult for him. As a matter of fact, it was difficult because not only did the Jews hate him, but the Christians were very leery of him. Matter of fact, they were told the first time that he went to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself with, with the other uh, apostles and disciples, but they wanted to have nothing to do with him. But there was a man by the name of Barnabas, whose name, really, Barnabas was a nickname. His, the, the, the nickname Barnabas means, listen to me that now, encourager. What a wonderful thing to, to live such a life that when people thought about him, they just gave him the nickname. Now that's the encourager right there. Well, Barnabas found young Saul and brought him in and introduced him to the disciples and, and he spent uh, about two weeks there with them, even James, the brother of Jesus. And, and he became accepted there. How discouraged he must have felt. And then he was sent home by those apostles, sent back home, kind of to, back to Mama's house, back to Tarsus. Well, he wasn't accepted there either. But he was sent there because they tried to kill him in Damascus. And he had to escape being lowered down in a rope basket out of a window at night. Tough life. But when, the, when, when Christianity reached the providence of Galatia to the city there called Antioch, Barnabas was sent to scope it out and see if they were doing all the right things. And when he got there, he said, you know what? Young Saul would be great in this place. And he sought out Saul, and he got Saul to come and help him. And they became almost co-ministers there. And when the missionary movement began, it was Saul who began that missionary movement. And the gospel started to go to other places. It wasn't easy. That first missionary journey, cities like Lystra and Antioch and Derby, he was actually stoned and left for dead. He was beaten. It, they, they did not like him in any way. He lived a life of discouragement, but yet God placed around him people that were encouragers. In his last missionary effort, 
he came to a city called Ephesus. And there he met many people, but one person he met we're going to hear a little bit about today. A man by the name of Onesiphorus. So if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Let's look in 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter written from jail. And let's pick up in verse number 16 of chapter number 1. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. That's a word I want you to hold on to. He refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. You therefore, he's speaking to Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that this morning that we will be able to hear from you, Lord, and that you will be able to speak plainly and clearly to refresh our own souls. Lord, we need you. We live in a, a world that can be very discouraging. We're around people that can be uh, very cold and very indifferent. And Lord, it, 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 it can be a very weighty thing to live for you around so much negativity that's all around us. But Lord, we thank you for those people that you brought into our life that lift the burden, that help us, that encourage us, that strengthen us. But Lord, because we know that is, that is your very hand working through others to minister to us. So Lord, thank you for this ministry. And Lord, may we also take this ministry on and encourage others in the same way that you've encouraged us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. One of the interesting things that happened to Paul, young Saul, when he got to the city of Ephesus, was they began to share the gospel like they did in all the other cities. But it's interesting here that in every, we are told that in every area of Asia Minor, a very large area, modern-day Turkey, that everyone heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't have churches on every corner. They didn't have internet. They didn't have TVs. They didn't have radio. All they had was just personal sharing of testimonies. And the Bible says that they went and talked to everyone one by one and went from house to house to where everyone heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But through that time, it was very hard. It was very difficult. It was very discouraging. Could you imagine the great work of God being done, but could you imagine all the forces of evil that came against them to try to stop them? And if you could bring it against the leader, if you could get that one to trip up and fall and fail, the influence or the shadow of that would go everywhere. But praise God, in the life of the one that we know as the Apostle Paul, God placed around him people that were encouragers, beginning with the great Barnabas, who's, who we even, oh, his name was Joseph, but we all only think of him as the encourager, Barnabas. But we also hear, here in Paul's last letter, there was a young man, in Ephesus, whose name was Onesiphorus. And he had the great thrill, listen to me, of ministering into the life of Onesiphorus. But he also got the reciprocal effect of the one that he blessed becoming a great blessing to him. Nurturing and ministering to him. Now years have gone by, He's been taken to, to, to jail. He's been taken all the way to Rome, shipwrecked along the way. He was placed under house arrest. 
let loose for a little time, but then rearrested and put into a dungeon prison where only light that he had would be the little window at the top where when the sun would come by at certain times, it would come through the, the this jail cell below. He would be chained to one person on one side, chained to another soldier on the other side. Could you imagine that would be in your life? They really must have thought he was a bad man chaining him up with those people. And what if his, what about his spirit? I mean, if you had to be in one place for just a few hours, you would become discouraged. But this was now his life. But his heart beat to, to let others know about Jesus. I kind of think it's unique here in 2 Corinthians. It tells us, he says, don't worry about it because God is using this for the furtherance of the gospel. People are hearing the gospel that would not have heard it otherwise. He, he's, could you imagine being chained to Paul and hearing him praise God all day and, and, and pray to God and sing blessings and, and, and things? And think about that song, He Will Hold Me Fast. I mean, they were chained to him, but he was thinking in my soul, I've been set free. I mean, you can do whatever you want to this physical body here, but Christ has cleansed me and set me free. And that effervescent Spirit of God was with him everywhere. But isn't it funny, the one who wants to be a blessing can somehow be discouraged because life can be difficult. Life can be hard. And circumstances are the same for all of us. Y'all listening? There's nothing uncommon about what you're going through it happens to all of us As a matter of fact if we can really get honest and talk about it all of us are feeling some of the very very same things but in this jail cell he begins to thank God for this friend called Onesiphorus look what it says in verse 16 here he says the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus for he often refreshed me to understand this word I want you to think about a hot day I mean one of those super hot days and we live in the south here and in the south we have this thing called humidity right and when you're having to work out in the humidity I call that stupidity but I mean you just walk out and and it just kind of hits you like a ton doesn't it and you're out in it and that heat can be so oppressive I believe it or not, I've actually roofed some houses. My first house I ever roofed was for my, my dad's and my mother-in-law's. And, you know, they like cheap labor, I guess that's what it was about. But you're up there and it can be in, in the summertime, it can be hot, and you got that asphalt paper down there and those shingles, and it gets so hot that they they begin to stick together, and you're just you're just up and down and up and down, and it's hard and you're your back hurts and all that. But but one day I remember I, I, I'd roofed up to the top and I got to the top and I stood up and, and on that blistering hot day there came this fresh blowing wind over the top of that roof and that cool breeze. Y'all, can y'all feel it? It just hit me and it just like, it almost got a cold chill on me. It was just It was just so refreshing. To feel that cool breeze coming through. I find it very cool. I like that. When Paul was thinking of the words to describe his friend Onesiphorus, he said, he often refreshed me like a cool breeze. You ever been around somebody that just encouraged your heart? Just being around them made you feel better? It's like just their spirit lightened the burden, lightened the load, and everything just got better. You know, there's some people, if you see them coming, you just want to duck and go some, a different direction. But there's others when you see them, it just blesses you so very much just to be in their presence. Come on, can you think of that person right now? This is the word. Literally, it means the blowing of a fresh breath upon you. How wonderful it would be to have someone like that in your life. How absolutely marvelous it would be to have a few people like that in your life. And how truly blessed you would be if you had a network of people who who sought out how to bless you 
and to encourage you and to lift you up and to strengthen you and to stand beside you and to help you and to make your burden less heavy as you go through this thing called life. That's who Onisphorus was to him. And of all the resources that are out there for us that we think that we really need, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure if there's one that's more important than someone who would just pour encouragement into our lives. Into our lives. You've got those people. I have those people in my life. As a matter of fact, on my way to church this morning when I was driving in, my best friend is my wife, but my, my, my best male friend, he's been a, he was a, a member of the very first church that I pastored in 1989. We became, he's an only child, and we, we say that we're brothers from different mothers. We're just so very close, but on my drive into church, I got a text from him just to encourage me. Now, I'm so holy, I can't tell you that. I don't text when I'm driving. But I did read it. When I got here to church, I texted him back and just thanked him for thinking of me and encouraging me. Isn't it amazing that on a day that I'm going to preach on encouraging, my best friend would call or text me just to let me know that he's praying for me and thinking of me and praying blessings. See, my prayer is, is that the answer to that prayer is for you, that I can get refreshed, come on, so that you can get refreshed. Sometimes I think God's in heaven, and He sees us with the, the hot drudgery of life, come on, and it's like from heaven's throne, He just kind of wants to go and blow refreshment over our spirit. Do y'all need that? Like a cup of cold water on a hot day to quench that thirst? Look what else it says here. He said, He often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. I mean, Paul is in prison because of the preaching of the gospel. But he, on this verse, didn't run from that. He ran to that. When Jesus was in trouble and tried, every one of his disciples left him. Even Peter cursed and said, I don't even know who that is. How alone Jesus must have felt. Have you ever felt alone? When you go through these things called life, he is not ashamed of my chains. But we could really say he wasn't ashamed of the issues that I'm going through. Anybody here got issues? You know, in our society today, if you're the wrong type of person, if you've got issues, others will run from you. Have y'all ever lost friends? I wonder. I have. I told him the very first service there was one of our church members that was here that I knew years ago that I was going through a very difficult time and, and there were things that were being said about me that just weren't true. But one of our church members that was here this morning stood up and, and whether they believed or not, he testified on my behalf. And I tell you what, he encouraged my soul. And I told him such this morning. I praise God for that. The people that don't run from you but run to you. They're not ashamed to be associated with you or for what you go through. I, I got a friend, pastors a great big church, and it's the church where all the cool people go. I mean, y'all know that church? I mean, everybody goes there, it's just part of the cool part, and they just, everybody likes them. Every, I mean, it's like you go to church to be seen, you know, everybody, hey, how are you? Everybody's, everybody's there, and I'm like, I don't pastor that church. I'm not being rude to y'all. I'm just kind of saying, y'all are kind of the ones I want to hang out with. We all kind of go through things. Is that not true? I mean, y'all might think you're perfect. I don't think you do. 
Matter of fact, you may have Satan come up behind you and try to talk and tell you that you're not worth anything in your ear, try to beat you down a little bit and tell you all the negative stuff about you. That's not the Holy Spirit of God, I grant you that. What the Holy Spirit of God does is the opposite of that. I love the fact that Paul said when he came, he wasn't ashamed to be. He came to me. He wanted to be associated with me. May we be such a church. May we be such a people. I have a friend of mine. He, he was a, uh, had done some work in some churches, and they kind of pushed him aside. He said, Brian, we need to start a church. I said, oh, okay. And he said, um, I know what we'll call it. I said, what, what's that? He said, Black Sheep Baptist Church. And I said, well, amen. Because we're all the black sheep of the family, so to speak. You know, look at the ones that Jesus chose to be his disciples. I mean, Judas Iscariot, well, let's, let's throw him aside. By, by the way, the, the most educated one of the disciples was Judas Iscariot. The one who could speak two languages, the only one, Judas Iscariot. The one who didn't make it, Judas Iscariot. But you get some common folks like fishermen and tax collectors and other such. That's the ones Jesus wanted to hang out with. The Pharisees, they, they, they didn't have an encouraging spirit. But the others did. I love this fact here. Look, look what it says here. He loved unconditionally. And it says uh, in verse 16, he says, The Lord grant mercy to the house of On Onesiphorus. Verse 18, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord. Evidently, mercy means what we re don't receive that we do deserve. Evidently, there's some things that happen in Onesiphorus' life or in his family's life that made other people discouraged, but not, not Paul. He said, may he find mercy. I find that those who receive mercy are more willing to give mercy. Those who have been forgiven of much are more willing to forgive much. And those who have people around them who unconditionally refresh them are more eager to be a refreshing to others. Look what else it says here. He says that he often refreshed me. He wasn't ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. When he got to, number one, he went to Rome to refresh Paul. But when he got there, he had no clue where Paul was. There wasn't a directory. There wasn't a GPS. There wasn't internet. There wasn't a phone. There, how do you find someone? And Rome was a huge city. They tell me there's four million people in Atlanta. Could you imagine being the person that goes to find one in four million? Without, how do you do that? All he had was one voice and two feet. You think it took a while? Do you think he got discouraged? I wonder how many times he said, do you know this guy by the name of Paul? Never heard of him. Oh, you might find him here. A dead end there. A dead end here. But, but really... Looking here at this, this scripture, it says, He sought me. He went after me. He zealously found me. That means he went the extra mile to find him. You know, Jesus said something about that. Going the extra mile. If they ask you to go one mile, what was it Jesus said? Go two. In that day, a Roman soldier, if they saw you, they could take a, a pack that they have and lay it down and say, Pick it up and carry it. And you know what? You had But you only had to carry it one mile. After one mile, you could lay it back down and you could walk away and you didn't have to worry about it because you had done what you were responsible to do. But Jesus said, don't just carry it one mile, go two. How wonderful it would be if we could be that second mile Christian. How wonderful it could be. To, if it's the right thing to do, don't become discouraged. But just to keep on, and keep on, and keep on, 
until you get through with your mission. What was it like, you think, for Paul? Chained to those soldiers. When he looks up, and who does he see coming into the jail cell? But Onesiphorus. He's a Christian too. He's not ashamed of that. He's standing with him. I wonder what the look on Onesiphorus' face when he saw Paul, but I wonder what the look was on Paul's face when he saw him. You think a smile may have come up? You think that he, the burden might have got a little bit light? Maybe, maybe like a cool breeze coming to him. And he thinks about all the times that Onesiphorus refreshed him and ministered to him while he was at Ephesus. But I'm not sure that anything meant as much as at this time. As at this time. I can think of all kinds of stories, and I'm sure you can too, of when people were in need and someone showed up at the right time in the right way just to say an encouraging word or maybe just to unconditionally be there with their presence. And it made everything good. How blessed we would be to have someone like that around us. Can you think about them? You think about the person that just being there made you smile. How wonderful. How glorious. And folks, we need this. How great it would be to have a friend like that, or a few friends, or maybe even a network of friends. Now, in Scripture, y'all know that the chapters were not broken up. Paul just wrote the letter. Later on, they put the verses to it and the chapters to it. And sometimes the chapter break means there's a different subject coming up, but not necessarily. So hearing everything that we just heard Look what the next thing is that comes up here. You therefore, my son, he's talking to Timothy, another one that he ministered to, another one that he had poured his life into. He says, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, everybody else has left me. At the end of his life, he says all those that, that were, when everything was going good and the ministry was going good, everybody was there wanting to be a part of it. But now that I'm in a jail cell, they've all left me. But he says, young Timothy, by the way, Timothy pastoring at Ephesus. He said, be strong in the grace that God's given you. Be strong, not weak. But let the flow of the blessings of God come strong and mightily in your life. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Beginning of this church here, uh, I, I began to, uh, a series of sermon on our spiritual disciplines. The things that we need to have a part of our life every day like spending some time in prayer, some time in the Word of God. And, and I want to promise you, it, when, when your soul is discouraged, getting on your knees with God and praying and pouring out your heart for, heart for Him, heart to Him, and, and getting in the Word will encourage your soul. But I also told you, and I'm going to remind you, and I, if, you're, if you think back, you'll remember, I told you that I was going to remind you all year. These spiritual disciplines that we do, they're not just to be done by you privately. You have your own prayer time. You have your time of reading God's Word. But remember I told you, you're never going to get to the next plateau of success and the one after that until you start doing them with other people. And that may be uncomfortable for you, but it's necessary. 
And Paul, when he thinks about this person that is such a blessing to him, who sought him out to encourage him and refresh him, he says, young Timothy, this is the spirit that you need to have. So all these things that I'm telling you in, in this epistle, all these things that you've learned, all these things about God, make sure that you share it with others so that they can share it with others. Here's the key. God wants us to do life together because we're stronger together than we are separate. How many of you have been discouraged? Oh. And you needed someone to help you up. One of the greatest chapters to me personally in all of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul said, I was going through so very much. I thought I wasn't going to make it. I thought I was going to die. But God enriched my soul and God let me receive encouragement so that I can share encouragement with others. I have been encouraged so that I can encourage so that they can encourage. It's multiplication. God does a work in my life and enriches my soul. And I don't just take that and keep that and hold that. God wants to use the hurt in my life and the encouragement that came from it so that others can receive it as well. We need to do life together. One of the things I said at the first of the year when I talked about our spiritual disciplines was I said we needed to do fellowship together. We needed to study the Bible together. We needed to pray together. We needed to serve side by side together. What I personally believe is when you start serving the Lord side by side, you get strengthened. While you're trying to help others, you receive strength. I know 2020 has been difficult. It's been very hard on me. I, I'll be honest, I tried to keep the stiff upper lip, and, um, and, and I think I did pretty, pretty much for a while. But I, I'm going to be honest with you. It snuck up on me. I kept hearing about other pastors that were discouraged. But it snuck up on me. And I really didn't realize how not being together was hard and how not being able to minister, how difficult that was in this year of a pandemic. We, uh, Lynn and I got away this past week, our anniversary week, and uh, we took some pictures. And I started looking back at the pictures and Folks, I've noticed I have grayed a lot in the last year. I started looking at what I was 12 months ago and what I now I knew I've been losing hair. Every time I get my hair cut, they say, You want you want to see the back of your head? I said, Nope. <laughs> I don't I don't care to see that at all. Amen. But I didn't I didn't really realize how gray I've gotten in just a short period of time. Now I'm all right with that. But I, I just want you to know, we think we're doing all right, but sometimes things take a toll on us. We don't even realize how big of a toll that they are taking on us. And we need each other. How many of y'all got one of our cards this morning? Now, y'all don't give our secretary any trouble because it says small goop sign up. Y'all don't, don't say anything to Laura. She'll, she's going to crawl under the desk when she finds out she let off the R. This should have been in your uh, bulletin when you came in. How many of you have one? Daryl, are there any more back there? I'm not going to call you Burhead. I guess I just did, didn't I? Does anybody need one of these? The little blue cards? Is there any up there? All right. If you don't have one, raise your hand. 
I got some down front. Inside the bulletin, there is a listing of small groups that we have here. Now, in 2021, we have learned that um, we've got to do everything that we can at any time that we can. And for years, we've only done it at a certain time on Sunday morning. And we're going to have those classes for every age group that are out there. But we have some, Mark has uh, kept together with his uh, small group on Zoom. And they're going to keep Zooming. Praise God, let them Zoom. Uh, we also have groups that are going to be meeting during the week. I'm going to be leading two groups. I'm going to do a morning group and I'm going to do an evening group so that no one will have an excuse if they want to be a part of my group. My wife's going to be teaching a group. I think she's going to do hers on Tuesday morning at 8.30. So ladies, if you want to be a part of Lynn's group and you have the mornings off, uh, you can be a part of that. Janice Smallwood's going to be teaching one in the evening. Uh, we've got, I'm not saying you have to do it at a certain time. What we're saying is, is we're going to open it up to where, it, where you, you can do it at any time. We've got some people that are hosting them in their homes. I've got a place that's here in town that I love to go to. I get coffee there, and every time I go in there, there's always this group of people that are praying together or doing a Bible study together. I don't care where we do it. In the first century, they didn't have buildings like this, and they did it in, in public squares, and they did it from house to house. I don't care. We want to do it in every way possible so that people can have a group of people that they can meet with and encourage and pray together, and study God's Word together, and do life together, and do service together. I don't know that we understand this, but we need this. We need this desperately. And it may get you outside of your comfort zone, but I promise you, growth happens when you get outside of your comfort zone. And all you're going to find is a group of people that are just going to love you, that are not ashamed of you, that will associate with you, that will take you unconditionally, and you're just going to do the same with them that they're going to do with you and how blessed you would be for it. I look around this room. I see people. I see two that lost their moms this year. I've ministered to people since 1994 who, do, who have addictions, the one thing that they will tell you is they need to do life together. We need the encouragement of friends. And a church needs to be the one that's help, help, holding out a helping hand. So I'm going to ask all of you who can, if you just put your name down here, and if you know a group that you want to join, you put here. If not, just put, I don't know, and we'll help you find one. But at the end of the service, give these to somebody. How wonderful it would be if when people thought about us, they would say, that's someone that encouraged my soul, that blew fresh air in my life, that was there with me, when I go through difficulty. I don't know why I thought about this. But the pastor of the largest church in the United States. His adult son committed suicide. And they were there at the house. And could see where he had hung himself. And they called 911 and called the church office. And within an hour, everyone in his small group was standing with him in the driveway of his son's house as the people were there doing what they needed to do to minister and to do all the appropriate things. And here is a man who has ministered to millions. who had his small group surrounded him in the driveway at his point of need. You may say, well, pastors don't need that. 
He needed it. I need it. I dare say you need it too. The Bible says to have friends, you must first be friendly. We, to be encouraged, we need to be around encouragers. But we may need to be that encourager. You may need to be there so someone will be blessed with what you're going through and what, how you can help them. We're not going to do a formal invitation like we normally do. I'm, I've battled the invitation too. They told me we couldn't have people come forward. I, I don't know how to do it any other way. But this past year has been difficult. We're trying. But I just want to pray with you and pray for you. And at the end of the service, I'm going to be right here if I can minister to you in any way. In any way I can. Church, I think we need to hear the Word of God today. Paul had no idea where serving the Lord would take him. I'm just very grateful that it took him to a place where he could minister. But there was someone willing to minister to him and didn't count the cost. And Paul was better for it. May we be such a people.